pleased to welcome Joan Biskupic this evening to discuss her new book, Breaking In, The Rise of Sonia Sotomayor and the Politics of Justice. Biskupic began working on this book a year after Sotomayor joined the Supreme Court, which she says began as an exploration of her rise in the judiciary and the progress of Latinos in America. But of course, the book took on a life of its own as the justice's decisions became as groundbreaking as her own career path. Biskupic has covered the Supreme Court for more than 20 years. She was the Supreme Court reporter at the Washington Post and at USA Today, and she's currently legal affairs editor at Reuters. This is her third book on the court, and it's just out, uh, in fact, officially tomorrow. It's already getting lots of terrific praise, and we're fortunate to have her here tonight to launch her tour. Please help me welcome Joan Biskupic. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming here. It's been, it's so great to be here to talk about Justice Sotomayor, but it's also great to talk <coughs> about what just happened at the Supreme Court this morning. Here I thought I was going to have this kind of leisurely day. They were only going to hear arguments in this car search case, but they went and denied all the same-sex marriage uh, cases that were pending. And at about 2 o'clock, just before I was supposed to do a Twitter chat, a very new genre for me, I, um, my editor said, could you whip up a, an analysis about why did the court do this? And I said, well, first of all, I have to do this Twitter chat, and I have to like do this all in 140 words. And somebody said, no, Joan, that's 140 characters. <laughs> so, I said, so I said, okay, yeah, I got that part wrong. And then after I do that, then after I do that, I have to be at politics and prose. And you know, you hate to say this on this call that everybody's on telling you what to do. And I said, and that's, uh, that's not negotiable. I'm coming here, and I'm going to see all you people. And as I was driving up Rock Creek Park, we put some finishing touches on things. So, <laughs> so hopefully that all worked out. Again, thank you. I thought what we do, what I'd start with, is talk a little bit, um, offer a vignette that I use in the book that I think illustrates why she was the one who broke in, and then talk a little bit about uh, what I was trying to do in terms of the chronology of her life and how it matched with uh, the progress of Latinos in the law. And then um, talk about some key moments of hers on the bench, and then open to questions, because I mainly appreciate hearing what your questions would be. So let me start this way. The party celebrating the end of the Supreme Court's annual term is an exclusive affair that bears all the trappings of the staid cultured institution mm -hmm. and its privileged occupants. Festivities are staged in two majestic rooms that face each other across a red carpeted hallway. Oil portraits of the nation's chief justices, all men, all in formal garb, line the oak-paneled walls. Crystal chandeliers hang from the high gold glazed ceilings. As the end of the term party for June 2010 was approaching, Chief Justice John Roberts sent out invitations to all the staff. He mentioned the customary platters of hors d'oeuvres that would be offered and the law clerk's musical parodies that would be presented. And he also reminded all the invitees that this was open only to full-time court employees, not to part-time workers, not to interns, interns or contractors. Again, reinforcing the special nature of this. Now, I should say, um, yesterday when I did a, a little C-SPAN thing, somebody said, well, how did you know about all that? Were you actually there? No, the, I'm the last person they would let come to this. But uh, several of the justices actually told me about this event, and then I was able to get more, and then one of one of the officers of the court actually even gave me the program from it. So um, several of the justices actually filled in the blanks, uh, but when I told Chief Justice John Roberts that I knew several things, he said, really? So um, he was one who was not so happy that I know all this, but it's, uh, it's a harmless event and it was a wonderful event. And what happened in this June 2010 uh, party, I think is, it sort of tells a lot about Sonia Sotomayor. She was about to attend her first such party. She, of course, was the nation's first Hispanic justice appointed by the first African-American president. And I should note here, for anyone who's wondering, that I do use the words Latino and Hispanic interchangeably, which Justice Sotomayor herself does, and so does the Census Bureau, and so do many researchers. But I know that that can be kind of confusing. But she herself refers to her, herself as <coughs> Hispanic, as Latina, as Puerto Rican, and um, I do vary those words throughout the book. So we're at the party, and the justices and staff have heaped their plates with food, taken seats for the entertainment. And Justice Sotomayor is sitting near the front, as is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who at this point in 2010 has endured some of the toughest months of her life. 
Her husband, Marty, had died just three days before this party. And as many of you know, Justice Ginsburg is a survivor herself of two serious bouts of cancer. But she made sure she did not miss anything leading up to the end of the court term, and she wasn't about to miss this party. Her close friend, Justice Scalia, always an easy target for the clerk's parodies because of his exaggerated mannerisms, secured a spot along the back wall of the room. And as the rows of wooden chairs quickly filled, other people began to line the walls too. About 200 employees crowded in. So the Chief Justice begins with a Jeopardy-like trivia contest. And uh, one of his aides marks everything on a whiteboard for the three clerk teams of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they're fielding queries, uh, uh, you know, just your basic trivia questions. And then the musical spoofs begin. And these law clerks, the young, uh, mostly Ivy League trained attorneys who assist the court, assume the roles of the nine justices. Now, they keep these parodies pretty tame. Um, as most of you know, precedent, consistency, decorum permeate this building. Uh, that, that kind of consistency in relationships is valued in the law and in, their, and in their personal dealings. But Justice Sotomayor was about to upset these expectations. And again, I use this to sort of show why it was Justice Sotomayor who crossed the barrier and became the first Hispanic ever appointed. So as the skits are ending, she suddenly springs from her chair, turns to her law clerks and declares they were all well and good, but something was missing. She gets them to then cue some salsa music. And she, yeah, I don't think, you know, there's no crying in baseball, there's no salsa at the Supreme Court. There really, you know, I can't imagine that there was ever salsa music playing, but she gets it playing on a small, small portable player, and then she becomes, begins dancing. And first she beckons other clerks to dance with her, and then she heads toward Chief Justice John Roberts. <laughs> And the audience is very apprehensive because this is a venue where, as many of you know, the clerks perform and the justices watch. And they all stay seated like this. So, and this is tradition rules. But the chief decides to be a good sport. He gets up and dances with her briefly. <laughs> then she seeks out other partners. And as I talked to the various justices about this, some of them said, I saw her coming to me. And I said, please, God, no. You know, because you know, they, they're all, you know, they are, they are an uptight bunch. So I could kind of sympathize as they were talking to this. And um, uh, so Justice Kennedy gets up, does a little jitterbug style move. Justice John Paul Stevens, at this point, he's still on the court. It's June of 2010. He's, the 90, uh, he's age 90 at this point. He gets up, but he feels like he has two left feet, and he quickly sits down. Then all of a sudden, she shouts, where's Nino? And he's at the back. He's at the back of the room, and he starts shaking his head. There was no way that he was going to dance, but he does. But he does, too. And then Justice Alito, tall and shy, looked even more awkward, but he got up, too. So now the rest of the audience is kind of into the spectacle. They're standing up. They're laughing and whooping. And so the justices are, are with it. She goes up to Ginsburg. Now, Justice Ginsburg, who has just endured what I said was just a terrible set of weeks, she doesn't want to get up. You know, she's, she's sitting right here in the front row, and she does not want to stand to dance it. And Justice Sotomayor whispers to her, Marty would have wanted you to dance, referring to her husband, who actually was quite a party man himself. And so Justice Ginsburg gets up, and she does a little step. Then she sits down. Then she takes her two hands and she puts them against Justice Sotomayor's cheeks and says, thank you. And as the program closed and people began leaving the room, emotions were very high. It had been a difficult term. I should say this was also the term of <coughs> Citizens United. The Citizens United case had come down in January, several months before this. But Sotomayor's enthusiasm was catching. Scalia, who could shake things up in his own way, jokes as people pass, I knew she'd be trouble. <laughs> and that's, that is sort of how I characterize Sonia Sotomayor breaking in and standing out. She had spent a lifetime challenging boundaries and disrupting the norm. And as the episode showed at the end of her first term, she wasn't one to wait her turn. If she had waited her turn, held herself back, it wouldn't be her who had stepped forward and gotten this special honor. And I hope to show today how she's a different kind of justice and also to mention how her trajectory was so much in line with what was happening for all of Latinos in America. She was born in 1954, the year of Brown v. Board of Education,
but it was also the year of Hernandez v. Texas, which was the Warren Court decision that said that Hispanics could be a protected class just like African Americans. That was the first time that uh, any, any group beyond African Americans uh, could be protected um, under the Equal Protection Clause that way. And then in the 1960s, when she's in the Bronx, those are the years that the Civil Rights Movement is uh, building. And she's, she's, see, she's seeing a couple things. She's seeing the rioting. She's seeing places in the Bronx that are burned down. She's seeing you know, just what we all observed uh, if we lived in cities that involved you know, African Americans or Latinos. And she's watching this. Then she goes to Princeton in 1972, which happens to be the first the year that the Secretary of Labor orders an increase in representation for racial and ethnic mi minorities. Incidentally, when she started college, only 10% of all Hispanics between the ages of 18 and 20 were attending college. So she's riding this wave of change, and she's part of the civil rights upheaval, and she's also benefiting from what po politicians and public policy scholars are seeing would be an important need out there, answer, answer the need of these minorities, and also maybe cultivate the political potential in this Latino constituency. For her part, Justice Sotomayor gets through Princeton, gets through Yale. I also want to mention, uh, while she was at Yale in 1978, that was the year of the Bakke decision, which many of you know uh, this, uh, was the event when the Supreme Court for the first time declares that affirmative action is constitutional in a measured way. That was the same year that a partner with the firm of Shaw Pittman had said to her at a recruiting dinner, did you only get into Yale and Princeton because you happen to be Puerto Rican? So she's right there. She's feeling the backlash. She's getting the benefits, but she's also feeling the backlash. So this is where I essentially, I now pick up her life. After I kind of give a little bit of her background in this book, I pick up where her memoir leaves off. Uh, where she starts to connect with very important people, such as Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, which helped her get on the, D uh, the district court in New York. Uh, she, he was looking at the time for people to recommend to President George H.W. Bush, and he was very interested in looking for diversity. And she came, to, uh, she came across his, um, her resume came across his screening committee at the time in New York. And I make a point in this book about how she represented so much of what he had been interested in, from his writings in The Melting Pot and his statements during the John K all the way back to the JFK years. You know, Moynihan was at the scene, and it was Moynihan who helped elevate her for the first time to the bench. Uh, he knew that he had something special in her as a highly credentialed individual uh, from Yale and Harvard who understood what it was like <coughs> to be on society's bottom rungs. So we have her kind of advancing. I, I go through kind of a little bit of what happened with the confirmation, pro how she got on the, uh, the district court, then how she was elevated to the, uh, the Second Circuit based in New York, and how it was Alphonse D'Amato, a Republican, who actually made it happen for her, and how he made it happen. Uh, the point being that she really knew how to play the political game. And then we get up to the confirmation process and how much she, at various points, uh, takes advantage of all she learned along the way to counter what, um, what happened to her during that process, which frankly was relatively smooth in the whole, whole scheme of things. Um, she, she, you know, had to walk away from the Latina, wise Latina comment, certainly. She had to uh, explain her vote in the Ricci firefighters decision, but she, she, handled, she handled them. And if some of you remember those hearings, you'll remember that, you'll recall that there was a lot more talk about her interest in Perry Mason than how the court it has evolved since Marbury versus Madison. There were very, it was, it was not uh, a complete, it was really not a, the a kind of intellectual exercise that uh, we had come to expect from Supreme Court nominations of the past. It was much more of her showing her sharp political instincts and showing what a good agent she was for herself. So briefly before we get into some questions, let me just mention a few things about what she's been like on the bench. I compare her to other groundbreaking justices to some extent. You know, how did she differ from Thurgood Marshall? How did she differ from Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the first African American and the first woman justice? And one way I would say immediately is just recall how she's a generation behind. When Thurgood Marshall was named to the Supreme Court, it was 1967. Uh, he was a pioneer in every way. He had founded the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was appointed in 1993, had a history of being very active on the cutting edge of women's legal rights for the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Sonia Sotomayor was not a pioneer in that way. She was not somebody who helped found the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund. Rather, she was a board member years, years later. So she has said uh, that she, she was not a flamethrower. Those are her words. She, she was not going to be like Thurgood Marshall and tell stories of her own upbringing and legal experiences in the conference room. She was going to pr approach it uh, differently as more in the lawyerly judicial fashion that she felt would reflect her 17 years on lower courts. But she was different. And as she showed with her own memoir and the speeches she's given, uh, the many, many speeches she's given, she still talks about being different. And she talks about the, how she felt different even during the confirmation hearing, when people would second guess whether she was up for the job. And she said it was very painful to have people say, you know, is she really qualified? Can she really write? And, you know, of course, we saw different, different pieces in the New Republic, the piece that was entitled The Case Against Sonia Sotomayor. We know about others who so spoke to President Obama and said, ah, she might not be as smart as she thinks she is. And she said, you know, that was very painful. And she chalks it up actually to her ethnicity. She said, why else would somebody have second guessed me after 17 years on these lower courts other than the fact that I was Hispanic? But then she also decides to still sort of separate herself from others. Uh, she said um, in one early speech right after that salsa incident, a student asked her if she felt comfortable now at the Supreme Court or if she felt that she was still different. And she said, she said, do you ever, when you're that different, feel comfortable? And I think that one thing we've seen from her first years on the bench, which we're hitting to a five-year anniversary, is ways that she's expressing that difference. And one, one I, I'd note would be in the criminal procedure area. When she is upset that the justices aren't taking up a defendant's appeal, she will break away from even her fellow liberal justices and write about that. Uh, she has, uh, she'll still speak out plenty uh, about problems with process. She comes at it in a very different point of view. She was a prosecutor, remember? She, was, she had a background that was not unlike Samuel Alito's in some ways as a prosecutor, but she's, but she's certainly different. Uh, in terms of how, she, how that manifests itself. She knows that uh, prosecutors have a lot of power and what is important for courts is to ensure that that power is used fairly through fair processes. Uh, the one kind of interesting scoop, I, I feel like I have a couple different scoops in, the, in this book, but the one that I thought was most important that I thought revealed her was uh, a, a dissenting opinion she wrote in the University of Texas affirmative ash, action case that never made the light of day. Just to refresh your memories, it was uh, the case brought by a, a white woman uh, by the name of Abigail Fisher who challenged the University of Texas's uh, affirmative action policy that was based partly on race. She didn't get in, and she went to uh, Louisiana State University. Now, when the justices heard oral arguments in this case, it was uh, uh, two terms ago, it looked like they were going to reexamine the 2003 precedent in the University of Michigan case that had allowed uh, race-based affirmative action. But what happened behind the scenes is that the initial vote <laughs> was that uh, the conservative justices did have a majority, and Sonia Sotomayor was in the minority with um, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, and, and just herself. Justice Kagan, who was the fourth liberal on the court, was recused because she had worked on the case uh, <coughs> when she was in the Obama administration. So they take this initial vote. And Justice Sotomayor starts to write this very scorching dissent that only she could write. She says things about how race matters, and she talks about the slights and the snickers and the things that, that people of color have to put up with. And it's, a, it's, a decision, it's an opinion that kind of throws her colleagues. Uh, even the liberal justices pull back and wonder, you know, do we really want this said? Uh, the more conservative justices are thinking, well, that's not, you're suggesting we don't quite get it, we do get it, and they go round and round. This case was heard on October 10th in 2012, and the ruling didn't come out until June of 2013. I found out about it this way, and this is a lesson to the reporters in the room. You know, you never know when you'll get somebody to talk, and I was talking to one of the justices, and I said, you know, one of the points I'm gonna make in this book is that Justice Sotomayor has become a very vocal advocate and um, for for minority rights off the bench. You know, we've mostly seen her uh, speak about the 
uh, needs of Hispanics, African Americans, maybe the poor and disenfranchised in more public statements. But on the court, she hasn't set herself apart in, on immigration issues, on other racial cases. You know, I just happened to say that. And this justice says to me, well, you don't know what happened in Texas, do you? And I thought, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and, then I, and then after I got some information, I was able to run it by other justices and double check things. Uh, and this was one that I actually did not bring up to the chief justice. After I brought up the salsa thing and he wasn't crazy about that, I thought, I'm not going to tell him what I learned at a conference on the <laughs> University of Texas case. But it, it did make me think as a reporter, what was it at that moment that allowed me to get some information and then subsequently allowed me to, to have it verified by other justices? Um, and. Uh, if you if you do books, you often will tape record, and you will be listening to your tapes, and you'll think, please shut up. Let them talk. So I thought, well, maybe just for that moment, I was letting somebody else tell me something that I didn't know rather than jumping in. And the one thing I would say about that episode that uh, makes up almost a whole chapter at, toward the end of the book is that even though I was able to get a more majority of the justices to talk about this and find out what went on, I don't have the documentation, and you never really know what happens unless you see all these draft opinions that circulate. And on the, that note, I'll, I'll say, when I was asking justices for any language that was in this draft of dissent of Justice Sotomayor, I said, you know, kind of what phrase did, did she use? What did she say? Can't you give me something that will help me convey it to readers? And a couple of them said, just wait until you see what she writes in the Michigan Schutte case, which was the most recent. Um, ballot initiative affirmative action case that the justices ruled on um, uh, earlier this year. And indeed, when we saw that opinion, it, that dissenting opinion, it marked the first time that she had ever dissented from the bench. And that was when she essentially said things that she expanded on things that she was thinking when she hadn't quite prevailed, when she ended up prevailing in the Texas case. Uh, but they stood, they stood there then in the, um, in the Michigan one. And uh, you might remember that some of her colleagues were put off, some of her more conservative colleagues were put off that she would even air some of her personal sentiment about things and also uh, criticize other justices for essentially not getting it, not getting what it, um, uh, some of the problems still associated with race in 2014. And that brings me to my final point about how effective she's been at setting herself apart. She's broken, she's broken from colleagues in ways that certainly resonate with the public, certainly resonate with readers, have resonated with some of the justices. But the question is, you know, what will this make on the law? Will, will she end up prevailing more often than not or more often than not being in dissent? And right now it looks like she'll mostly be in dissent. So I, I conclude by saying, as surprising as her salsa dancing was at the end of the first, um, first term party, some justices are now saying that it really reflects the core of her personality, her character. She shakes up proceedings and confronts her colleagues in their private discussions of cases. When she asked them to dance, they did. On the law, they might be less likely to follow. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. And we'll all, I hope all of you stay to have some some treats, and yes, they were a little bit of bribery, but it turned out maybe I didn't need it. But um, <laughs> at any rate, please ask me about the book or anything about what happened today or anything. What happened today? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the Supreme Court, instead of taking up same sex marriage, which we thought they would, said no. So, yeah. No, not at this point. Yeah. But why? Well, oh, here's it. Okay, yes. Okay. So <laughs> The justices don't say why. And when I went up to the courtroom to watch them ascend the bench for their first oral argument of the session, they betrayed none of the concern about the confusion that they might have left behind. So I have actually, the piece I ended up writing was sort of speculating on why. And you can think, you know, first of all, they might be waiting for a, a true split in the uh, circuits, the U.S. appeals courts. Uh, we've had nearly 40 rulings uh, since their Windsor decision, virtually all upholding, saying that there should be a constitutional right to same-sex marriage. And the justices traditionally like a split. But I do have to say that I thought that they would intervene sometime this term, even without a circuit split, because it was such a big case of importance. But I, um, I think there are a couple theories. One could be that they're still remembering how Roe v. Wade unsettled so many people and had a backlash. That could be it. But what I actually lead with tomorrow is the notion that Maybe both sides aren't quite sure where Anthony Kennedy is. Yeah. Uh, Justice Ruth, he's the key vote in this, of course. He's the one who wrote uh, the three major gay rights rulings of the past. 
Uh, he wrote the Windsor case that lower court judges have really run with to allow same-sex marriage, or at least to rule for it. And Justice Ginsburg, when I had an interview with her in July, when I asked her, what do you think would happen? She said, I don't want to make any predictions, but I will say that Kennedy's Windsor opinion goes in two different directions. In one direction, he's talking about individual rights and dignity and liberty for gay couples. But in the other direction, he's talking a lot about federalism and how the federal government should really let the states do what they want. And she said, uh, it's hard to know which way he'd go. So one of my theories is maybe those on the left and those on the right uh, weren't sure where Justice Kennedy would go, and Justice Kennedy himself might not know where he's going to go. So for this moment, uh, what's the effect of today's ruling is that we originally had 19 states in the District of Columbia that permitted same-sex marriage. We will now have automatically five more states allowing it, and then probably six more because they're in the circuits that were at issue here. So that's the news bulletin for today. <laughs> oh, by the mic. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yes, um, I'm wondering uh, it, when you say that uh, uh, Justice Sotomayor was a uh, worked the system, if mm -hmm. you will. Uh, it was a, was very canny in a political way, mm -hmm. and obviously she didn't come from a political, per se, background, yes. not an elected background, as compared with Sandra Day O'Connor, who did. And I'm wondering, I mean, um, obviously it, it looks like they're going in very different places. Uh, Justice uh, O'Connor was very much the, uh, the, the swing vote and coming up with balancing tests and that sort of thing. And it sounds like Justice Sotomayor is being very much the, the uh, perhaps a little bit of a lone wolf uh, in some ways. But I'm just wondering about the, um, your sense of the two, and I know you, you wrote about Justice O'Connor, uh, your sense of these two women, the first woman, the first uh, uh, Latina woman, um, what their, uh, their political uh, uh, experience or how that plays into their judging. Great. Thanks for the question. First of all, nobody accidentally gets on the Supreme Court. It does, it does take, it, uh, it takes either some political smarts by that person or supporters of that person. Uh, probably the last kind of accidental justice, but not even quite, would have been David Souter, who she succeeded, uh, who, wasn't, who wasn't known for his political instincts, but certainly had lots of people around him who were. So Justice O'Connor, uh, just to refresh your memories, during her time on the court for nearly 25 years, she was the only one who had been an elected politician in her prior life. She had been a, an Arizona state senator, in fact, was a groundbreaking Arizona state senator, the uh, first woman nationwide to ever be um, head of a state senate. So she, she um, really came to Washington knowing how to count votes. Uh, but Justice Sotomayor is an incredible quick study, and she, she watched what Senator Moynihan and his staff did on that first go round, and she knew that nothing nothing happens without a lot of pushing and shoving. Channels have to be greased. I found in Moynihan's files, which are at um, the Library of Congress, all sorts of letters that even back in '91 she had faxed to his aide saying, "Hey, you might want to think about this. Might want to think about this." She um, there was an issue about her age. If I'm remembering right, she was just about 35 at the time, mm -hmm. and there was some question among some of the H.W. Bush administration people, including coincidentally John Roberts, who was helping vet judges then about her being a little too young. So she did a list of all the other judges that had recently been appointed who were in their early 30s. So and she faxed. It, faxed it in and said, you might want to look at this, too. So I think she, she learned from the experience with Senator Moynihan, and then she really learned from uh, when she dealt with Senator D'Amato, and I'll tell you that very briefly. Okay, it's 1998. President Clinton has, uh, is trying to elevate her to the Second Circuit that would really put her in line for the Supreme Court at some point. Rush Limbaugh is saying, do not approve her. Uh, Senate, uh, Senate Republicans are saying, do we really want this to happen? The Wall Street Journal is editorializing against her, saying, if you let her on this, district, on this appeals court, she will be on a rocket ship to the Supreme Court. And what she does is, so she, and the Democrats are having a hard time getting her a vote. She and her people, well, it's her people go to Senator D'Amato, who at the, that time was running for re-election against Chuck Schumer for the New York Senate seat. And they say, look, you need Hispanics to win that election, get us a floor vote for Sonja Sotomayor. 
And D'Amato does. D'Amato goes to Trent Lott, who was then the Senate Majority Leader, and says, all right, give this woman a floor vote. They give her a floor vote, and it, it happens in late October. We're right before the November election. And they give her a floor vote. She prevails. Um, some White House staffers deliver a dozen white roses to her. Uh, D'Amato loses. But, <laughs> but, but D'Amato, D'Amato is not a sore loser on that. He encouraged his colleagues to approve her in 2009 when she was up for the Supreme Court. But she was the one, I mean, people from the Clinton era say she was the one, her people. They got to D'Amato and they said, you want to win that race? You get that floor vote. So there you have it. Thank, Thank you. you for the question. Yeah. I thought one of the underappreciated stories of the last several months is this Court of Appeals situation with what, what constitutes an exchange and who can get the subsidies. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I get the sense the Court of Appeals gave the Obama administration an awful lot of time to implement this by scheduling these arguments quite a bit in the future. What's your take on that? Okay, so what um, what the gentleman is referring to is the fact that the D.C. Circuit, which is a very po powerful court here in town, is going to rehear the question about um, uh, the state exchanges for the health care law. And uh, they've set December arguments, which essentially means that w however the D.C. Circuit rules, the Supreme Court won't have it at it this right. year. So that will give the administration even more time. And there is a lot of thinking that the more time the administration has to enact this, to let it, uh, not enact it, but to carry it out, uh, the more people will become more accepting, both, uh, both as a legal matter but as a practical matter. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to return to the p political acumen um, mm -hmm. issue that you were just, uh, um, just talking about. Um, it seems to me there are two different types of, uh, two different processes, political processes that we could um, the, pr the processes that are important in getting on the court in the first place, getting nominated, getting confirmed, separate from the acumen or the political uh, um, knowledge that's helpful for a justice that's already on the court mm -hmm. in trying to um, sway other justices in. Uh, so I, w I wonder if you could, ad could address that, what, um, and using uh, justice Sotomayor, as as an example, for not necessarily uh, just her, um, is there is there a big cost to pay for a justice to uh, go too far out in um, in the writing an opinion, a dissent? Uh, is there a benefit to siding with other justices in some cases when your feelings aren't so strong, in hopes that they will side with you and through some. Uh, unspoken process perhaps that's a, that's a good question and first I want to say that having looked at all at many justices papers um, uh, Lewis Powell Thurgood Marshall Harry Blackman William Brennan um, I think maybe it was just those four at this point I haven't seen horse trading I haven't seen the kind of horse trading I'll vote for you here you vote for me there but there's certainly times when somebody might hold back a concurring opinion just so he, he or she doesn't dilute the value of the majority in some way. So, so I'll, I'll get to the idea of, you know, maybe little, not so much favors, but accommodations. But you've really struck on something important. It takes, it takes a certain kind of human skill in politics to get yourself even positioned to be on the Supreme Court, as well as real legal smarts. And then when you're working with people, it's like any kind of d dynamic. You know, you take any nine people in any room, and uh, you've got folks from all sorts of walks of, well, not, we don't have folks from all sorts of walks of life anymore. We have mostly lower court judges who've been elevated. But you still have lots of people from different parts of the country, and, how, and they work differently with each other. And it's like any human group. You, you'd, if you ask the question, you know, what happens if you push too far? <laughs> See Antonin Scalia. You know, he has pushed his colleagues too far many times, including Sandra Day O'Connor. When Sandra Day O'Connor came on this court, uh, on the court, she was far more conservative than when she left the court. And some of that might be, have been some pushing and pulling. Initially, maybe some pushing and pulling by William Brennan. Seth Stern is here, who wrote a biography about William Br Brennan, so he knows all about that. But she resisted the liberal inclinations of Brennan, and then she resisted the more conservative inclinations of Scalia. And, and she, was the kind of, she was a real reaction formation kind of person in that regard. Now, Sonia Sotomayor, the incidents I talk about here have stood out, but generally speaking, her experience as a district court judge and an appeals court judge is pretty much kind of routine. She is, many of her opinions 
are run of the mill. They don't show a real fiery passion as she did in this affirmative action case. So I don't see her as really pushing her colleagues as a matter of course, the way Scalia might often do. Um, but that's the kind of thing, it's like anything. You want something, you have to figure out um, how to get it. And maybe one way to get it is to make sure the channels stay open and people realize that you, that you can compromise sometime too. Right. On the health care ruling, when the Chief Justice uh, went over to the more liberal side to uphold it, basically, there was some comment, there were some questions about whether one of the reasons that Justices Breyer and um, uh, Kagan might have ruled with the more conservative side on the Medicaid part of it might have been just to accommodate. That is my phone ringing. I am sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is my phone ringing. So anyway, I hope I answered your question. Exactly. Spot on. That's Thank exactly you. Thank what you. I had in yeah. mind. Thank you. Sure. Yes, and actually the phone ringing reminds me that I told editors that if you have questions, come here. So. <laughs> Bob, do you have a question? Yeah, you, you mentioned that there were some, some competing nominee, possible nominees. My recollection is that one of those <coughs> competitors was uh, Elena Kagan, mm -hmm. who, who got the next appointment. Mm -hmm. And my, my impression at the time, and I think other lawyers felt, that she was by far the, the sort of the towering intellect of, of the group. And, but she wouldn't get it because she wasn't Hispanic. Uh, any comment on that? Well, she eventually got it. She eventually got she it. She eventually got it. And what she and look, I um, it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time she was appointed, uh, by the time Sonia Sotomayor had been appointed, we had at least 20 years of presidents saying that they wanted to appoint the first Hispanic. So in many ways, it was long overdue. It's a big statement. These folks are politicians. They want to make that statement. If you're going to say, I'm about to elevate my solicitor general, yeah, it's not. You know, yeah. it, it, she might. She might be, as you say, uh, someone who is, has a towering in intellect, but it, might, it won't have the political punch. He instead nominated somebody who was Hispanic, but who also had the kind of credentials that most of the other ju justices on the bench did. And it's, it's interesting. I thought that when I wrote the Scalia book, I was done with my most polarizing subject. No, <laughs> not at all. I, am, I find that uh, people have very strong opinions on both sides. People have strong opinions about whether uh, people still say, eh, was she really the best? Should she be on the court? Well, who's to say who's the really the best is anyway? It's a really unusual test. There are a lot of smart people out there. There are a lot of folks who, um, uh, who would qualify to be on the Supreme Court. But then I get from the other side um, people who say, why do you talk about how she was so politically savvy? You seem to be you know, minimizing her uh, legal ability. Well, it takes more. It takes a whole package to do it. And for President Obama, that whole package also involved speaking to people who felt like they hadn't been represented on the court. Thanks, Bob. Hey, Nan. The question was Bob. Okay. So two quick questions. Sure. One question on everyone's mind is, is Ruth Ginsburg going to step down <laughs> over the next two years? Um, two, Sonia Sotomayor and Clarence Thomas are polar opposites on the issue of race. And certainly to Sotomayor, this is a critically important issue. What is the nature of their relationship on the court? How do they get along? Do they confront each other in conferences? I'm just curious. Sure, that's a good question. They, they have their differences with each other at times. But the minute there's any challenge to one of them from outside, they close ranks. They, they know they're appointed for life. It's in their interest to get along. So in the day-to-day -day meetings, the time on the bench, the meetings in conference, the lunches that they have after oral arguments, they're, they're a fairly social group. They're not trying to challenge each other that way. I have been told that in their private conferences, she can be quite confrontational, but not toward Cl Clarence Thomas as a person, but more just to say, look, have you noticed this? Have you thought about this? The behavior that we all see on the bench, which is pretty assertive, pretty much right out there, uh, she doesn't hold back with her questions, that that goes on in conference. But again, not directed toward Thomas personally, uh, but toward people who would have a different point of view. Uh, he and Justice Sotomayor both went to Yale, both had very different experiences there. She certainly appreciated her, uh, her time there in a way that he didn't. He felt that everyone thought that he was there just because of affirmative action. 
he has felt, we, here are the two kinds of statements. You know, he feels completely stigmatized by affirmative action, that people have been second guessing his abilities and intellect because he was held because of his race. Sonia Sotomayor stands up and says, I am the perfect affirmative action baby. I took advantage of the opportunities that were given me. I worked hard. The kinds of honors that I got at Princeton, she, this is her talking, the kinds of honors she got, the top pine prize, they're not given out to people just like little pats on the back. So they have a very different approach. And in the book, I do contrast their views of how willing to, how much you should own affirmative action and then how much you should want it to carry on. Because as we know, he thinks it shouldn't be carried on. He feels that it does have a very dangerous stigmatizing uh, effect on lots of people coming up today where she says people coming up today still very much need it. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay, that's the question. I, I do talk to her regularly, and she says, I'm staying. I'm staying until I feel like I'm slipping and I need to go. And then you say to her, well, you know, what do you say to all these politicians and these liberals like uh, Nan Aaron maybe? No, <laughs> no, because you are not pushing her to go. But some people have been writing that she should that she should leave. What do you say to them? And she's got a couple different answers. One is she says, you think even in this atmosphere, if I were to go now, President Obama would get anything resembling the liberal that I am? That's a question. And the other is, she basically thinks politicians should should get their house in order, win the White House again, <laughs> keep keep going on. Don't don't ask her to worry about what would happen if a Republican president came in and what would happen to her legacy. Now, that all said, no matter how much she's protested whether she would go or not, I still think there's a strong chance that she would leave next term. You know, she is, she's 81, she's in excellent health, you know, she works out all the time, she's, uh, she's always on the elliptical and doing all these different things. So she doesn't feel she should go, and she has her colleague John Paul Stevens who didn't go until he was 90. But um, you've raised a question that I, that, uh, you know, is clouded by her own legacy. And if she goes at an inopportune time and is succeeded by someone who's a conservative, a lot of her legacy disappears. And I was about to say I would predict that maybe she would go next year, but I, up until this moment, this morning at 9.30, had predicted they would never outright turn down those gay marriage cases. <laughs> so I'm not going to touch that. Good question. Thank you. I just wonder if you would again address um, when when she wrote the dissent in the Michigan case in, uh -huh. in April. The most recent one, yes, exactly yes. right. And when, as I understand it, that she read it from the bench. Right. And it's 58 pages. Thank 54 you. 54 pages. Uh huh. Um, having grown up in a southern, in a Mexican American community mm -hmm. in southern Arizona, ah. what she said really resonated with me. I'm white, I'm not a minority, except I'm old, but. <laughs> I've got some of the but lines here, too. Could you tell about that? I know you were there. Oh, well, and I was there almost accidentally. Uh, this is, uh, thank you for the question, because I can tell, <laughs> yeah, her question was, what was it like when she, for the first time, dissented from the bench in the Michigan <laughs> Affirmative Action case just of this April? And that one tested not uh, affirmative action in higher education directly, directly, it was more, uh, it was a Michigan uh, ban that had been approved by voters that said uh, the state government couldn't have any uh, ra racial preferences in, in across the board, including in higher education. And the question was, were the voters, was this a permissible thing for the voters to do, or did it compromise equal protection under the Constitution? And actually, Justice Breyer even signed on with the more conservative members to say voters had a right to do this. But it's April, and we're not, you know, this case, the, um, this Michigan Affirmative Action case, uh, known as Shooty, was, um, was heard in October. And it, April would have been a kind of early time for it to be coming, because we knew it was a, a difficult case. It happened to be the day that the court was hearing the um, aerial TV signal, the uh, downstreaming thing. So my partner, Lawrence Hurley, was going to be up there for that one. And I said, look, I'll go up to the earlier case, which happened to be a, a uh, speech case, a politician's lying case, the Susan B. Anthony one, I said, I'll cover that one. I'll cover that one for us, because normally I don't, I don't cover the mid-range cases. But, you know, just to spell you, I'll do that. And I was so glad, because there I am, as they're announcing the opinions, and it's the, this Michigan case, which is, you know, highly controversial. 
And then she starts to deliver this 13-minute um, descent from the bench that went on. It was 12 or 13 minutes and went on you know, just about as long as Kennedy's opinion for the majority had gone on. And she said things like, in fact, I have a couple of the lines because they really struck me. Race matters because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments that reinforce the most crippling of thoughts, I do not belong here. And this is what she wrote in that opinion, but it really had strong echoes of what she has said when she's been out speaking, particularly to student groups. So it was quite a big moment. And then I had to decide, do I stay for the rest of the case or do I come downstairs? So anyway, I stayed for the case. Anyway, thank you for asking that. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go back in history a little for this one. Sure. Uh, it's something that's been niggling at me. Uh huh. Uh, Harriet Myers. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a conspiracy theory <laughs> that they never really uh, had any plans whatsoever to have her on the Supreme Court, but they put her up, and all of the ridiculousness that went around that made it that much easier to confirm Alito, because after all that, how do you say no to Alito, who was the one they always wanted in the first place? That, is, that was my conspiracy theory. Well, she definitely was done in by her own party. If you remember Robert Bork, he's referring to Harriet Myers, who was named to succeed Sandra Day O'Connor on the second round. First, the, uh, John Roberts was named, but then John Roberts is elevated to chief when William Rehnquist dies. This is all in 2005. And then uh, President w, uh, George W. Bush then has to fill the O'Connor seat and names uh, first Harriet Myers, who had been his White House counsel and who went to, I think her law degree was from Southern Methodist University, if I'm remembering, which kind of raises the question of this whole, you know, everybody we have on there now attended Yale or Harvard. But she, she was seen as a lightweight by her own people, by uh, Robert Bork, went on the air and said, her nomination is a disaster in every way. <clears throat> uh, as she went on her Senate courtesy visits, uh, she had, uh, she, she stumbled over Earl Warren versus Warren Berger. You know, just a, a few little things that um, you just don't want to do on those courtesy visits because those are already laying the groundwork for your eventual nomination. So she pulls out uh, at the end of October, and uh, the White House then nominates Samuel Alito, who you're right, uh, they might have wanted anyway, or had a stronger, at least ideological interest in, in um, having on the bench, and he has made all the difference in this court, succeeding a centrist conservative in Sandra Day O'Connor, and now pushing things farther to the right. So, two things. Thank you all for being here. Please eat lots of food, and I'll sign your books.